For Krima Media's policy, I'm Tabi Madiba, self-leadership coach Ndumi Khadebe discusses a book titled Handle Black Text Like a Pro. So your book is an engaging and practical guide that provides people with a roadmap to stronger relationships, better finances and overall well-being. So for those who are unaware, what is a black text? Well, the book is, a, is more about boundaries than it is about black text, actually. But mm -hmm. the reason why black text is, the, um, is primary in the discussion of boundaries is because all of us are going through it, yet no one is talking about it to their families. And the reason why that is, is because we fear losing our loved ones should we take a risk of actually communicating our boundaries. Mm. But coming back to what black tax is, basically black tax is that thing that we pay, we pay black and brown people. Uh, we've inherited it because um, our parents did not, or our forefathers did not participate actively in mainstream economic engagements. Okay. So with that, what it meant is that they could not access business opportunities, they couldn't advance themselves in the corporate ladders, and therefore it meant no money. It meant just doing jobs where you got by as opposed to actually having a career. Mm -hmm. And where that leaves you and I is that then we inherit the deficit that they inherited from their forefathers basically. So our parents, parents, and so on. And somewhere in the introduction, I actually mentioned that it's, it's a necessary duty. It is necessary that we take the responsibility of black tax to pull each other up. The trick is how do we do it responsibly? How do we do it with love and compassion? How do we do it in a way that it's not taking away from Tabi? Instead, it empowers you and your children. Because if you take away from yourself in terms of saying you will give away all that you've got to a point that you don't save, then it's destructive, actually. Mm -hmm. You are helping someone else at the expense of the financial potential of your family, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So that's the premise of the book. And can you briefly talk to us more on how you struggled with the innate human need to belong? Wow, that is like... You punching right there. <laughs> Innate need to belong. So, I mean, all of us do go through it, mm -hmm. it. And I don't think that it's something that you need to be shameful about. Mm -hmm. But I feel that I struggled a lot with the need to belong because I came from a strict background, strict parents, where you are told who to be, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. So you never get to know who you truly are. So it means then you must belong elsewhere to feel validated. And that is why there's a lot of people out there who actually think that it's better to do what others are doing as opposed to doing what they need to do. Because they've been conditioned to please those around them, but more than anything, they need this belonging. But coming back to me, um, what the struggle basically of belonging meant that I had lack of boundaries in relationships, at work, um, and in my later years, in my late 30s, in business because you are constantly looking outward for answers instead of mm -hmm. actually looking mm -hmm. within. And that's what I did. And came uh, 2019, I was faced with a situation where I had nothing to show for, for all the time and the money, the energy that I've put in. I started working at the age of 18, but I had no savings, no robust investments, no popping career, no loving and thriving relationship. It was just you know, Bengoa, in other words, you know. Mm -hmm. So I went through a period where I was just like, okay, something is wrong here, and I need to fix it. I need to find out what it is, and I need to do something about it urgently. So my lack of boundaries delivered me into my journey of writing this book, essentially. And in your book, you said that you did not fully appreciate the approach of no expectations and entitlement until you started doing research for this book. Well... It's because I didn't quite grasp the extent of the blessing and the gift that was uh, having my parents say, you, the three of you as our children, invest your money in you, invest in your education, invest in your business, as opposed to pouring back into the home. So we still live where we came from, like where we grew up. We don't have pressure to make the house bigger, to move my mom to a suburb or anything like that. In fact, my mom's joy and success is knowing that we are financially okay, 
that we are happy in relationships and at work and that we are aligned with our purpose as individual children. So you you know what, what they say, you don't know what you've got until it's gone, mm -hmm. right? So in my case, I uh, feel that I was lucky that it was in the sitting down and saying, oh, this is actually a big deal that my parents are doing this for us. They are appreciating that when we're able to give, we will give, mm -hmm. but when we can't, we can't, and no pressure. And when I started researching, I started hearing stories about people who spent millions towards their, mm -hmm. their nieces and nephews and people who, who have paid for their uh, siblings' weddings. And I don't get it, you know, I'm just, it left me confused and I was gobsmacked at how parents can actually allow that to begin with. But secondly, I then have greater appreciation that my parents did not have to subscribe to the instant gratification phenomenon that exists where children are forced to be renovating homes right now. Like where now a person must go and get a loan and change a particular structure of the house. And when you think about it, that structure is not going to yield any results for this family, not for the mother, not for the person paying for it, you know. Um, so their wisdom, though to a, to a certain degree, felt like a bit of luck. But I, 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 I do have like a deep, deep appreciation for it now because I could invest in my business. I could take myself to tertiary with, with ease and not stress about sending money back home all the time. And your book lays out 10 relatable stories in which you explore boundary issues and emotional burdens relating to black tax. In story one, Beggar's black tax is beyond financial. So what is the price he is paying for not being able to express his personal truth to his mother? So Beggar's story is actually one of my favorites. That was the first story I wrote and uh, for the book. And what I love about uh, your question is looking beyond the financial aspects of black tax, right? Because everybody worries about the money and the book highlights that actually there's emotional and mental tax in which Bega does definitely pay in a sense that throughout the story he's expressing concern about whether he is lovable beyond money or not. And when you think about it, that question is a identity question and it brings fear into place, which means Bega could be one of two. If he has a lot of money, he's worried about losing the money because he wants to be lovable. If he doesn't have money, he's concerned fiercely if he will ever have money so that he is lovable. So can you see how this is really destructive for society to have men that are known or men that actually uh, hold the view or the belief that they are only lovable only if they have money. And another tax that he pays, Upega, in his story that's outside of money, is the guilt and shame that sits with not having the courage to confront his mother because he knows what he needs mm. to do. And that's what I'm trying to get everybody to do. Instead of us talking about black tax at over drinks and dinner, and on social media, let's afford our loved ones the opportunity to engage us about black tax. So he has just this constant anxiety and there's a part where he complains and he says, you know, no matter how prepared mm -hmm. I am with mm -hmm. my mom, but when I have to speak to her, um, then I, I just get a paralysis. And that paralysis comes from him just not owning his truth. And that is not good for, for him as a human, never mind as a man, not good for him as a human because it means he is lying to himself and also subconsciously he knows that he's betraying himself by not addressing the issue of black tax with his mother. And in another story you discuss how Zama and Nandi are paying a heavy emotional and mental tax trying to navigate their relationships with their father. So can you discuss this more with us? So that too is, a, is an issue of, of belonging because Zama and his sister are actually trying to have an emotional relationship with their father and he's absent on that front but he shows up at the end of every month mm -hmm. wanting the money right so firstly he didn't raise them now that they are working he is here 
right? He's showing up and he's demanding the money. And the issue that they battle with is the entitlement that he actually says, well, this is what black people do. Mm -hmm. When you work, you give back home. And, and imagine having to be told by a child when a, a child says, well, actually, you give back at least to somebody that has given you something. So his case is extreme. But there's a lot of people who walk the streets of South Africa with that dynamic where when they finally connect with the, with the parent, the parent demands financially, leaving the inner child and the child, because you're a child, I'm a child, you're somebody's child, feeling a sense of, would you even care about me if I didn't have this money? Would you ever call me if I, if I didn't have a job? And the reason why I find that to be destructive is because I do believe that human beings are worthy to be loved, whether they, they've got money or not. <laughs> you know, they, were, they are worthy of love, of giving love and receiving love. It's not to say that people should sit and not make money, but it's to say no one is an extension of their money. Money is an entity that we acquire over time and we, it comes and it goes. And we know that to be true. So if our identity or if our, if our having money m makes our loved ones engage us more, there's a, there's a question mark there about the caliber of this relationship, right? So the questioning of the relationship is not because they don't love their father. It is it's from an ethical point mm -hmm. of view. And it's just their need of wanting him to love them for being, not mm -hmm. for having. Mm -hmm. They're two different things. Mm -hmm. So do you think that black tax is a burden or an investment? Well, I mentioned that, that it actually depends on the individual. If you address the issue of black tax um, with your family, your boundaries around black tax, and nobody cares about your goals, your financial goals, you wanting to reduce debt, wanting to have financial freedom, then black tax is a burden. If it's happening at the expense of your financial growth, then it's a burden. If it's happening at the expense of the, your children's financial growth, then it's a problem, which means it's a liability. But also, if it feels awful, like when you get a, a black tax SMS and you're like, ah, oh, then black tax is taking away from you because that's basically how you start relating with money. And that's why the, the last uh, uh, story talks about success guilt, where, you know what, actually, if being successful is going to come with this huge responsibility, why bother? If you're not going to have the benefits of being successful, of growing, of thriving, because there's people that are sitting and waiting for your money, no matter what, mm -hmm. then it's bound to, to creep up as a liability. So Ubuntu is a responsibility that we inherit from the past, that we owe to ourselves and our children to do responsibly and do it transparently with love and compassion. And lastly, Ndumi, what are you hoping people take away after reading this book? Well, the most important thing is just for people to know about the five struggles of black tax that's in the second to last chapter of the book, because they are real, you know. So, for example, not knowing that there, there is a thing called boundaries, not knowing that the elephant in the room can be addressed, because some people have coached through, um, well, I mean, we've been role modeled for them to actually address the issue with the family, to set new boundaries. And they've been surprised how the family just went, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> because they didn't know, because yeah. we don't actually discuss these things with our families. I feel that the five black text struggles at the end of the book are important. And um, also boundaries with the self, which is the very, very last mm -hmm. chapter. But more than anything, really, it is going in depth about boundaries, knowing that boundaries equal love, mm -hmm. boundaries equal self-love. Because if I didn't care about you, I wouldn't actually map out the boundaries. I wouldn't communicate the boundaries with you because it means I don't care about the relationship. But if I did care about the relationship, I would actually communicate boundaries. Like for us to work well together in the studio, is it okay if I face this way and you do this way? You know, mm -hmm. um, it's managing the, what we've got at hand. And if we don't manage it, it means we don't care about it, right? So boundaries are simply an intervention that can help us manage our lives 
and can help us manage black tax effectively. Knowing what our boundaries are, owning them fully without judgment, and then communicating them with love and compassion. Thanks very much. That was Ndumi Khadebe speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about handle black tax like a pro.